My name is Jason Anderson, and this brief presentation is my contribution to the Decentering ELT conference, and I've called it Decentering ELT Research, Alternatives to Center Disseminated Best Practice Models. Uh, this presentation will address a paradox that often undermines efforts to improve teaching quality in ELT around the world, how we can avoid importing notions of best practice uncritically from the Anglophone centres of ELT that may be unsuitable in specific contexts worldwide. But first, a little background to this issue, to this narrative, um, the story so far. Many of you will be aware of this background, but for those who aren't, it may be useful. Quite a large number of authors over the last three or more even decades have argued that notions of best practice in ELT, particularly methodology, but also understandings of what constitutes a good teacher, what constitutes an appropriate curriculum, appropriate relationships in the classroom and so on have historically been disseminated from what we might call the ELT centers, to borrow, borrow Robert Phillipson's term, uh, to other national and local contexts around the world. And th over the years, quite a lot of evidence has been accumulated that for various reasons, um, these attempts often have uh, little positive impact and sometimes have negative impact. And the reasons for this include things like differences in classroom logistics, um, such as class size, social cultural factors, including, for example, beliefs of teachers in a specific community concerning what may be appropriate practice, curricular constraints, the difference between the mainstream curricula that many teachers around the world have to work to, where they're not able to be in control of it or to negotiate this very much with their learners versus the opportunity for needs-oriented curricula that you often get in tertiary education and private school contexts that are much more common in Anglophone centres, um, and so on, and financial factors as well could be considered. Um, but whilst I don't want to go too much into the background of these issues, I'd like to ask what alternatives exist to such approaches and how can we develop them appropriately and effectively? Well, to my mind, there seem to be two aspects to this challenge. The first one is how we can build a knowledge base of locally appropriate good practice specific to our context of interest. Um, and I'm focusing, I suppose, in this talk more on slightly larger scale understandings of context rather than simply my classroom or my school, including educational systems that may be at district level or at either a national level, in the case of many small countries, such as maybe Malawi, or um, in countries where education is typically devolved to state level or province level, such as in China or India, to look at how within these educational systems, um, there is sufficient investment, a significant number of stakeholders to facilitate, potentially, a coordinated research effort. And the second question that I'd like to kind of consider as well is how we can do this in a way that strengthens the research community itself, building collaborative professionalism, both from a top-down and bottom-up perspective at the same time. Um, and I've used this term collaborative professionalism, borrowed it from the work of Michael Fullan, um, who is a world leading expert in the educational change field um, for his work in many countries worldwide in implementing it. For Michael Fullan, collaborative professionalism is a key ingredient in implementing change or improvement in any educational system. He defines it as a commitment from professionals at all levels of the education system to work together and to share knowledge, skills and experience to improve student achievement and well-being. And you can see the image on the right hand side of the slide there, which shows some of the elements in his model. And both of the sources I've quoted here are freely available online. The 2018 um, source is a talk that he gives on this issue. And I believe that the same principles of collaborative professionalism can be applied in developing coherent approaches to conducting research within such a community. And I've 
called this collaborative inquiry for the purposes of this talk. I'm sure the term is not original and uh, exists, I know, in a few um, other models and approaches. Um, so first of all, it can be noted that if we are interested in developing collaborative inquiry, there are a number of sources of potential research evidence that we can draw upon that are likely to be useful for this. First of all, there is in any educational context, a large amount of research being conducted at any time. This includes things like teacher research projects, such as teacher action research, exploratory action research, exploratory practice, all of these in language teaching. Um, but there's also things like um, studies by research students, such as PhD studies and MPhil studies that are conducted under the supervision of university departments. Those departments are also also exist alongside the education departments in ministries of education, both nationally and on subnational levels, um, all of which themselves are involved in and um, are capable of conducting useful research. And indeed, I'm sure that all of these do conduct such research in their local context. But the question I would like to ask here is how much effort is there to coordinate research or summarize findings systematically? How much, for example, um, interaction is there between local universities and the local ministries or departments of education to ensure that what they do is contributing towards goals of developing locally appropriate good practice? And I would suggest that sometimes there isn't much such um, coordination. And indeed, what coordination does exist sometimes doesn't work very well because of different agendas. And it can be argued, I think fairly straightforwardly, that by bringing these agendas together and recognizing that universities do have an important role to play, um, that these two sources can work together more appropriately. I'd like to provide a simple example of one attempt to coordinate research findings that actually produces some really useful um, evidence for teachers um, about locally appropriate good practice. And it is this very simple example, um, a, but a powerful one, by Gita Durairajan, conducted in 2017. Um, and this um, article is available online if you look at the references. Gita summarizes in this the findings of 19 studies, main, mainly unpublished PhD studies conducted in her university or other universities in India on the question of L1 use in English classrooms and what impact it has on the learning process. And by simply bringing together 19 PhD studies, um, Gita finds very clear positive impact of L1 use in the classroom which I think is interesting and important. But she also notes that when put together, when brought together, these the findings of different studies can be used to suggest a range of paths that teachers, material producers, and curriculum designers and policymakers can tread upon, i.e. can draw upon, to develop their own practice and to develop understandings of good uses of the L1 in the classroom. So this example is just one simple example of how one university-based researcher drew upon a larger number of sources of evidence to understand more about how locally developed research can help to coordinate understandings of appropriate good practice. Um, I'd also like to suggest that there are other sources of research evidence that sometimes are underexploited. And one of them is one which I personally am very interested in because it was the source of the, um, it was the um, subject of my own PhD research is to look at the question of teacher expertise. Um, I would argue that imported practices, so-called exogenous from outside, often fail to embed, i.e. To, to take on, to catch on, for reasons of feasibility, appropriacy, and sustainability. Those three factors, I think, are always key. And therefore, rather than attempting to identify practices from outside our community, um, I believe it's 
a much better idea to identify extant if effective practices already working in our context. And this is something which Harry Kucha in his PhD research also did. Um, but in my case, I would argue that expert teachers are a really important factor here. They exist in all educational systems, and there's some examples there from some of my own research, um, yet they're almost entirely neglected in the search for appropriate good practice for reasons that, in this quote, Prior et al. Um, note that we need to seek out these examples to theorize them and to make them available as a resource for teacher education and policy making. And in my own research, I argue that often we overlook these because of the mistaken assumption that teacher expertise does not exist in uh, outside the kind of the more privileged contexts, higher income contexts of the global north. Um, but interestingly, if you even look at the Global Teacher Prize, um, over half of the winners of it come from countries which would typically be um, classified in the global south, depending on how you define that term. So there we go. Um, an, an example of a, a kind of research that I think would be useful in contributing towards the goal that I'm arguing for. Um, I'd now like to present a model that brings these elements together, what we might call a coordinated collaborative inquiry model. Um, I've color coded it according to the four elements involved, the community, the research that it conducts, the findings of these research, and the outcome that we're aiming for, which here I've described as locally developed understandings of appropriate good practice, i.e. Um, good teaching that is situated in our own context. The community itself, you can see there from the, the element on the left of the model, the blue element, includes, of course, teachers. It includes expert teachers who may be identified from within the community, as per the expertise literature recommends, um, graduate researchers and professional and academic researchers, both those based at universities and those based in educational departments and ministries of education. And we might also include in that NGOs development partners, such as an ELT, the British Council being a key um, example. All of these um, different um, elements of the community can conduct research. And this is an important part of the what I've called the coordinated collaborative inquiry model. There's, of course, the practitioner research projects of teachers, which themselves, if the um, um, effort is coordinated in some systematic way, can contribute to a database of findings of practitioner research projects. To give one example, in Bangladesh, all primary uh, teachers are expected to conduct uh, some kind of research project as part of their pre-service qualification. Um, and these projects aren't necessarily brought together systematically to notice what are the typical findings of these. And when brought together, I think these can contribute both directly to locally developed understandings of good practice and also to another element in this framework, the large scale studies that themselves, for example, meta summaries, meta analyses, and uh, for qualitative research, um, meta syntheses that themselves can constitute more rigorous research findings, which uh, may be conducted by professional and academic researchers who have more specific expertise in this area that can produce some really useful findings for the intended outcome. I've also included in here teacher expertise studies, which can contribute to what I've called an expert teacher prototype, i.e. a model of what the expert teacher studies in a given context seem to be saying constitutes appropriate good practice for expert teachers. And these can also be summarized through large scale studies or even experimental studies by looking at some of these practices and uh, subjecting them to more um, empirical research to find out whether they're actually effective, whether they have the required input on, for example, measures of learning or measures of student well-being in the classroom. I've also included here the supervised graduate studies that I mentioned earlier, um, which themselves could contribute to a database that could be linked to the other databases and also could, of course, contribute to the large scale studies themselves. These large scale studies can include things like critical experimental studies of exogenous research findings of interest. For example, if we in our education community want to ask whether an interesting finding of a piece of research conducted somewhere else whether that also applies to our context, I think it's important that we check that it does by conducting such 
um, critical experimental studies? And if so, these can then contribute both directly, either as rigorous research findings or to larger scale studies, um, larger scale experimental studies or meta-analyses that themselves can also contribute to locally developed understandings of good practice. When brought together, I would argue that all of these research practices themselves can help us to develop um, a vision of what is appropriate good practice. But I would also like to argue that um, by coordinating research together in this way, we strengthen not only the research community itself and its ability to um, produce useful findings, but also strengthen it through the professional development of the people involved. So we all know that teachers benefit from conducting action research. Well, the same is true about researchers working in professional institutions and members of the ministry. Within a collaborative professionalism model, all of these elements need to work together in order to achieve the outcome of interest. So there we go. There is the model that I'm proposing for this conference. I hope you found it useful and interesting, um, and I'll be able to answer any questions a little bit later in the in the next stage of it. Thank you.